thank you guys for coming out. As you can see, we've done this series for a while. Um, we've done a number of episodes. It started with uh, me and Tyler sitting down and I told him about this idea for The Modern Man. And after sitting down, what I thought was gonna be 45 minutes ended up being <laughs> four or five hours. five hours. He calls me a week later, he's like, Ted, when are we doing this? So we started doing it, recorded some episodes. He calls me a month ago, said, let's do it. I said, a live event in one month? And here we are. Go. Thank you, Tyler, for pushing us and, and getting us out here. We're gonna want to jump right into it, but before we do, um, you saw the logos up there. I have to give a thank you to our sponsors because an event like this is not easy, especially doing it in one month. So I want to big, uh, give a big shout out to first, really the Peace Center and Huguenot Law for hosting us this evening and having the availability and, and working with us. Also want to give a big thank you to uh, Gospel on Tap, which Jonathan, if you want to talk a little bit more about Gospel on Tap, we know the summer series is starting tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Gospel on Tap is a gathering geared for men. It's a place where dogma and judgment are left in the door and we embrace vulnerability, transparency, specifically around life, faith, the merging of those. Uh, it's called Gospel on Tap. We believe in the good news about Jesus is freely and immediately available to draw from, right? Just like good beer off a draft. And our summer session actually starts tomorrow night. We have three gatherings to choose from. We have one on Monday and then two on Wednesday. Uh, and we've been doing this for over three years. We've seen uh, well over 150 guys come through. Uh, they're eight-week sessions. Uh, and if you don't drink, you still can come. We have plenty of guys who don't drink uh, water, coffee, soda. But again, you can learn more at forallgoodthings.org uh, about Gospel on Tap. And we are just thrilled for the modern man and to be able to partner with uh, Ted Tyler in this movement, which is so critical for men. Yeah, Jonathan, thank you. And uh, also got to give a big thank you uh, to Logisticus Group, who is going to be represented here this evening. Uh, Vikash with Logisticus Group believes in what we're building here. So a big thank you to him and his company. Our Axis Financial Planning uh, and Investments, Catalyst Gym. I mean, as men, I think it's important for us to take care of our bodies and take care of our bank accounts. So thank you for, for them. And Empire Limited, which will also be represented here uh, this evening. Also got to look good with what you do. So if you're looking for some clothes, Empire Limited in Greer on Trade Street is a great place. But we're going to jump into today's topic and, and get started. And the way this is going to roll is each panelist, they're going to introduce themselves. And we really want to give you guys an opportunity to be a part of the conversation. The whole purpose of this is kind of open it up and really find out what men want to talk about. And there's going to be a microphone over here. We might invite somebody to come talk on that microphone randomly. There's going to be a Q&A portion later on to discuss. And of course, after everything's said and done, we're going to have some delicious food and some delicious eats from Uptown Company, who's also here. So big thank you to them for catering this event. So today's topic is creating space, the importance of men creating space and the benefits that can come about from it. And we're going to get on with the show. We're going to start off like I usually do, look at the camera. Pabs, give me a thumbs up if we're ready to go in three, two, one. What's going on, guys? You're tuning in to an episode of The Modern Man. This is an episode where we discuss, we, we, we explore the different challenges that men go through in today's society and really find out how men can live their best lives. We're doing it a little different today. We have a live audience with us, and it's the first time we've ever done it. So I'm going to allow the panelists to introduce themselves before we jump in today's topic. Tyler, why don't you start us off? My name is Tyler Harris, uh, Chief Development Officer of Consolidated Assurance. Uh, speaker, I guess, influencer, <laughs> whatever that means anymore. Um, but that's, uh, that's pretty much what I do. Charles Russ, I'm the CEO of R Axis Financial Planning and Investments, co owner of Catalyst Gym, personal growth junkie, and the guy you talk to when you need something. It doesn't matter what it is. The plug. <laughs> the plug. <laughs> My name is Tim Pecoraro, I'm the founder of Uphill Strategies. Um, I have a podcast, Uphill Conversations. My thing is, uh, anything worth having is uphill, but you can't go uphill with a downhill habit. So I try to help people live an uphill life, knowing that they can be more, do more, and have more. I'm Jonathan Parker. I'm the founder and CEO of 
All Good Things, which is a not-for-profit organization here that runs programs and environments around celebrations, conversations, and community. Uh, and Hymns and Hops is one that people have heard about a lot uh, here in Greenville. And last but not least, my name is Ted Fayton. Uh, I'm the founder of Modern Man. Um, the, I'm the morning anchor and meteorologist with Fox Carolina, and also I'm um, the host of the podcast No Rain, No Rainbows, talking about life being hard, but it's worth the squeeze. Go through your hard time to get to your goals. And I always end it with everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the pain, but you can't get the pleasure. Or everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain, but you can't get the pleasure with that little pain. I promise I do it better on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hop in today's topic. It's creating space and the importance uh, of men creating space and the benefits that they can get from it. First question, fellas, what does creating space look like? And don't say this, that doesn't count. <laughs> I told Ted, I was like, I don't want to be in the hot seat right next to him to get the mic first. Um, so creating space. Uh, creating space for me is creating an environment where you can be vulnerable, where you can be transparent. And I think we live in a society where, especially as men, we walk around and, and, and have this kind of puffed out chest, like everything's great. And hey, man, how you doing? Awesome. Hey, man, how you doing? Great. How you doing? You know, can't complain. But meanwhile... You know, their relationships are falling apart. Their business is barely staying afloat. They're in, you know, the worst shape of their life. And they just kind of have to go around and pretend like everything's great because that's what men do, right? Like we have to provide and we have to um, provide safety and security for those around us. And I think men need other men in their life that you can have the tough conversations, that you can say, hey, man, things aren't great. Um, it's been a tough week. Uh, this happened, this happened, and, and that space is created when that other person isn't trying to fix you. They're not trying to solve your problem. They're just really there to, to listen and to be a soundboard. And, you know, one thing that you'll learn about Jonathan, he's a great conversationalist, and is being able to ask then afterwards, you know, do you mind if I give you some feedback on that? And they may not want feedback. You know, sometimes you just want to talk about stuff. Sometimes you just want to vent and get it out there, and I don't need your feedback. I just needed to get that off my chest. But maybe I do. Maybe I do want to get your insight on something. So it's, it's creating those environments so that we can have these conversations that aren't easy but that are extremely, extremely important. And the only way we will become better men is by having better conversations. And I think those conversations are the ones that are real and raw and, and vulnerable and transparent. Jonathan, what do you think? When I think about creating space, there's this, this image I have. And for men, for myself, these guys here, and for you, we fill a lot of spaces, right? So you're an individual. You, you might be a husband or a significant other uh, with your life partner. You might have kids. You might be an uncle. And then you work. And then you hang out with friends. And be, we have this, this misunderstanding that because we fill a bunch of spaces, that we have space. And just because we're in a lot of spaces don't mean we have space. So when I think about this word create space, what comes to my mind is intentionally setting aside time for you to deal with stuff. Where you say right now for this hour, for this two hours, for this conversation, I'm going to deal with what's most pressing for me, what's most, what's most burdensome for me, or what's most exciting and celebrating, right? Men, we have a hard time celebrating. So when I think about creating space, it's wrapped around this idea of you intentionally set aside a time where you're not just looking to fill it, but you're looking to be present. You're looking to be all in. And because we fill so many spaces and we're in so many spaces, we need to understand that that does not count for intentionally creating space for you to be fully present in. So that's, that's what I think about. Oh, I guess that look means it's my turn. Um, well, I'll tell you guys one thing, like women actually have it figured out and I'll give you an example. So a woman sees another woman that she does not know has never seen before in her life. And she says, girl, you got some great legs and girls like, thank you, girl. And they snap and talk and it's great. My best friend since like elementary school sitting out here and I'm not going to ever be like, hey, yo, Davey, you got some nice shoulders. Whew, what you doing? That's not, that's not our, that's not how we react. That's not how we interact. But we should learn to a certain extent, still not talking about the shoulders, that that's okay. 
and that's something that we can build on and something in a place we can learn from. Um, I think the creation of space, the first thing you have to do, you can't take before you give, is to give space. So to create space. To the couple of guys out here that I mentor, interact with a lot, I think they would all tell you the first thing that I did was they knew it was okay to talk to me. They knew they could come to me with anything, with any problem, with any issue, and I was not going to judge them. I was gonna give them a separated look, I was gonna step away from the situation and come to them with, okay, so you have this interaction with this other person, let's look from all sides, let's get a real answer for it. So I think the creation of space first is making it okay for everybody else. Because if we all, if everybody in this room said it was okay for another man to talk to you about your issues, then I think we would all have someone to talk to, and that would be the first part of the solution. That's really good. For me, it's, uh, it's discovery. You know, the, where a person can actually discover who they are, like the real who they are, not the one that they show everyone else. We don't take enough time doing that, I think, um, people in general. So it's not just um, isolated to men um, because there is no immunity and there's no inoculation you can get uh, to not have those things bother you of not really knowing yourself. So discovery for me, it's the big what if place, the place like a playground to me. Um, everything comes from dirt in my belief. So it's where we're able to play in the dirt a little bit. And, and, it's, and it's good. And it's okay that you do it. And we can do it without worrying about, and as they said, having people in your life around you, not worrying about the judgment and people coming off on you as you're trying to figure some things out. Um, you know, when you look at a kid learning, you know, and congrats on the baby coming, Ryan. But when you see that child moving from rolling to crawling to walking, what do you do? You let them figure it out. And somehow we've lost that beauty of discovery as we continue to get older of figuring some things out. Like we've stopped. And so for me, it's, there's so much more to discover. So that's creating spaces, discovery. Now I'll kind of turn the question to the audience really quick. Show of hands, men, who has some place to go for emotional support or a space, a safe place to discuss their problems, their celebrations, and all things like that? Put your hand up if you have a, a place to do that. That's good, because I don't think a lot of men have that. You know, more often than not, they did a study, and especially men that are married, they said the wife typically has her husband and a group of friends as emotional support where the husband typically just has the wife. Well, fellas, where do you go if your wife's the one that's giving you the stress, if she's the one giving you the problems? Who do you talk to? Call Jonathan. <laughs> 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 Which, vulnerability. Me and Jess, we were having some communication issues. I called Jonathan. Why did I call Jonathan? Because he's not gonna call me and say, oh man, she's just being crazy. No, he's gonna, he's gonna dissect it with me. He's gonna say, well, what was your conversation like? You know, what was the reaction? What was the situation? And oh, Ted, she's looking for codependence here. So I'm able to go back to my girlfriend with something that's usable and build on something. And our relationship is stronger because I had somebody that I could be, I could be vulnerable with and not just talk about, hey, was, how was that game? I was able to actually discuss something that was bother bothering me at that time. For, so for those of you who put their hand up, Consider yourselves lucky because that's something really special to have. Now, for those of you who didn't, understand that you have the opportunity to create that space. With the second question, talking about creating space, is it something men do naturally or is it something that men have to do with intent? 100% has to be done with intent. It's not, my example was kind of like what I was saying. It's not natural for us because we've never been taught that. How many of you have had the answer to a question when you were younger? Oh, Dad, I don't feel good. I, you got a man up, boy. Yeah, put, put, grab yourself by your bootstraps. You know, and we all want to be self-made. We want to be hard. But our role is not the same as, as other people's role. We're the, in my description of the modern man, I said, we're the warrior leader. Being a leader, you can't always go back to your spouse. Uh, you know, if I'm an Army guy. Any vets? Any, any, any vets? Hey, thank you all. So if every morning I was in front of my platoon crying, sad, dejected about life, telling them about all these problems, but then I expect them to follow me into a firefight, how does that work? They're like, man, I'm not following that guy. 
What's wrong with him? He's always upset. He's always sad. He's always dejected. So I'm not telling you that you're not allowed to have those feelings, but the problem is you can't take those to your wife. You expect her to follow you. You expect her to go with you. You expect her to chase you. So you need to, to find someone to share those problems with. Because if you don't, they become bottled up emotions, which is a conversation that we've all, all had before, and they become problems later. But the fact of the matter is, you need to express it, but you can't express them all at home. It's, it becomes an issue and it becomes a problem immediately. One of the things that's fast, so I have three boys at home. So Titus Shoe Design, five, four, two. Soon to be five, four, three. And it's really interesting, because I agree with Charles, like at my age, I have to be intentional to create that space. Like I have to make a decision to go find space to be with other guys. But for my boys, it's very natural for them to find kids their age, to hang out with one another, to talk and to share emotions. I mean, they just cry whenever. If it comes through their head, that, you know, Daddy, you spoke really firmly to me. Daddy, this really hurt my feelings. Daddy, this is how I'm feeling. And, and I, I, like, I get weighed down by it. I'm like, good gracious, how many emotions do you have? But they have the same emotions I do. They, just, they don't have a filter. They haven't been told it's not manly to share your emotions or you're weak if you cry or you just need to like power through. Like if all of you would think I'm a horrible father if I looked at my two-year-old after falling and go, power through, son. Like that's terrible to say to a two-year-old. Well, it's also terrible to say to a 40-year-old. Like we're power, power, this dude's hurting right now. Tell him just, if he could power through, do you think he'd feel this way? Like, so I think that it is intentional now because I don't know when it happened, but we stopped allowing it to be true of man. And that hurts. So, like, I do think from the time we were born, we were born with desire to belong. The desire to, you know, as, as Charles said, to, like, be able to share and carry with one another. But I don't know where it broke down or where it became not cool for guys anymore, but that needs to change for the next generation. Uh, because I want my boys up here talking about other issues because I help them create space. Not how should we create space. You know, a lot of us are, are businessmen. And... You know, I think a lot of it for me is our worlds are going so fast. Everything's happening so rapidly. And there's a phrase that we use in our business and in particular with, with our sales cycle is sometimes you got to slow down to speed up. And I think that that intention that you're talking about, that intentionality, it's so easy to, to you know, be on you know, grind, grind, hustle, hustle, grind, grind, hustle, hustle. Well, I'm feeling something. I, I don't really have time to unpack that right now because I got I to gotta do this, I got to do that, I got to accomplish this, I got to sell that, I got to you know, make sure this person's served and make sure this person's taken care of. And then you go through this, go through this, go through this, and then all of a sudden, oh man, that, that really affected me. Like I, I should probably hash that out. Nah, just bury it and let's go and do this and do it. And, and it's just the world that we live in. But sometimes you have to be intentional to slow down and say, hey, what's the exit strategy? <laughs> If I just keep bottling this stuff up, if I just keep pushing this stuff under the rug, you know, what's, what, what's going to happen? And it's never going to end well. And so that idea of slowing down to speed up is this idea of taking time to be intentional and to start really working through some of those things. And, and quite frankly, for a lot of us, they may be things that have been buried for years, some decades, you know, stuff from, you know, you've been dealing with since, it, since you were a child, but never actually sat down to, to think about it and talk about it and work through it. And I think the longer that you wait, the more tough it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, to really unpack those things. So that where, that's where the intentionality is met with the sense of urgency in that you realize that by slowing down to speed up, you actually are able to work at a higher level and operate at a higher level and do more things because now you're operating out of your full capacity. And to me, I'm all about operating at full capacity. But what I know is these things that steal our capacity are those things that happened to us this weekend that you know, upset us, but we buried it. Boom, there goes 5% of my capacity tomorrow. And then we get in an argument with our spouse and boom, there goes 5% of our capacity tomorrow. And then you know, our business partner or a friend let us down, and boom, there goes 5% of our capacity. Next thing you know, you know, we're rolling into work Monday morning operating at 30% of our capacity. And so it takes that time to intentionally slow down, 
work through those things. Well, this happened the other day, and, and, and unpack that. And you know, how did that make you feel? And how can I make sure that that doesn't happen again? How can I have a conversation with that person um, that's not confrontational, but is, is a way for us to actually get through this issue that we have? And then all of a sudden, you start gaining capacity back and realizing that now you're actually operating at a higher level. And that slowing down enabled you to speed up. And I think the only way to do that is being intentional. You know, uh, and, I, and the intentional part is so strong. And what I love what Jonathan was talking about, that connection. You know, you don't look at this two-year-old, this four-year-old, and say, you know, power through, right? It reminds me of, um, and it's an incredible story, Mary Shelley, she wrote the book Frankenstein. And she couldn't really tell anybody about it because in 18, whatever it was, 16 or 17, you know, women couldn't, you know, no one wanted to listen to a woman write something that was monstrous like that. But the point of the story, though, was her, it, it dealt with her and her desire for connection. So this Frankenstein mo monster was her ex assembling this perfect creation. But when it opened its eyes and spoke to her, it, it, the, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, it, it freaked them out to where they actually did everything they could to stay away from the monster that they created. And I feel for us a lot of times as we're thinking about trying to be intentional, thinking about all of you know, these things that we've somehow through our domestication gotten programmed in our head all of a sudden, this switch of power through, don't be vulnerable, makes us, we're not intentional about unpacking something. It's still, we're like sometimes that thing that's been created and we're, we're craving connection but what we're doing is, is we're wrapping up ourselves with all of the things that have become a part of our dysfunctional being. How we're dysfunctioning as a human a lot of times. We won't unpack, we won't be intentional. So be, even though you're not gonna say power through to the two year old, I, get, I bet you'll hear it at 14 or 16. You can't cry, you can't break down, you can't deal with it. And so we feel like, who, who made this monster? And all I wanna do is connect. You know, it's just, a, it's just that weird part of, I think, what, what we feel like sometimes. We're pieces of many things, and all we're doing is we're craving connection. I think the biggest thing you're saying right there with craving connection is, let's say you're well, my older brother. He's a firefighter, right? And, you know, he's been the first on scene for a few bad crashes, and he's seen some things that just don't, don't sit well with him. And... His wife is, is home, he goes home, and she doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. And what he does is he'll call one of his coworkers. They'll have a drink, and he'll be like, man, I can't get that off my mind. That, that thing we saw the other day, I can't get it off my mind. And the coworker's like, yeah, me too. The crazy thing about that, it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't get it out of your mind, but it lets you know you're not alone. And that in itself is healing. That in itself is a connection. It becomes community. It becomes, I'm not the only one that's eating this. With that being said, is there anybody in here, and you could do a show of hands, anybody in here that's holding on to something, anything that's eating something? I should see at least one hand go up. Yeah. Like, we're, we're all holding on to something. Yes, we <laughs> appreciate the honesty. Yeah. I mean, we need, this is the biggest Me Too movement we can have. I'm just being honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's Me Too. I go through things, you know? So, I mean, if your hand's not up, that's okay. Because, you know, we're all holding on to something. We're all eating something, you know. I'm the kind of person that I'm hard on myself where I try and balance so many things. And, you know, if, if something slips at work, I'm like, oh, man, I actually look at myself. Am I, am I inadequate? Like, oh, I had a hard time at work, you know. The, Howard, he, he works me in the morning. I'll have some good mornings. I'll have some bad mornings. There's some mornings my prompter reading's not on. I'm messing up. I'm getting the stories wrong. And I self-reflect, and I'm like, am I insignificant for the job I'm doing? And that shouldn't even be in my head. But because I'm so hard on myself, I try and set my standards so high, I hold on to that. And I have to kind of, like, talk to people and be like, you know what? No, I'm better more days than I am bad. So anybody that put their hand up, does anyone feel like sharing? what they're holding on to. I know that's a big ask, but you know, there's a microphone right here. If you guys want to come in and be part of the conversation, feel free to share, because I'm willing to bet. I'll put money on it. You're not the only one dealing with it. This is a solution space. And, hey, there he goes, my man. Ben Harris, ladies and gentlemen. Be Harris. <laughs> but while Ben's walking up, guys, remember, this is a solution space. So 
we're the five guys sitting up here, but that's not that's not the goal. The goal is to create a, is to start creating a space for anybody to talk about anything they want to talk to to someone to people who will listen. And eventually, the rest of the the male universe is going to catch on. Like this is how this is how you can be better. Because I'll give you my example is. Um, so I was sponsoring, we sponsored the Children's Hospital Radio Marathon last year. Awesome event, great thing to do. Ted, I think, came out. But I remember I was setting up, and me and my girlfriend were arguing about something. It was stupid. It was extremely stupid. But I'm carrying eight bags, and I, I'm, I'm trying to get in there. I'm like trying to get in there so I can set up. I'm carrying these bags, but she's texting me. And it's an argument. So every time I have to go back to this argument, I realize how slow I walk while I'm texting. And as much as you think that's a joke, it's all about the fact that because my relationship wasn't right, I couldn't focus on what I was doing. I wasn't 100% committed to this marathon because 50% of me was over here. And as small as that sounds, that's an antidote for everything. And if you think it's not true, I challenge yourself and look. Think about when you're slacking at work. Don't, don't think about what's going on at work. Think about what's going on at home. Think about what's going on in the gym. Are you sleeping enough? Are you eating right? Think about all those other things and then reflect back on work. Because I guarantee you, it all affects everything. So like times like now, you're going to go home and complain, man, I ain't got nobody to talk to. You know what I'm My friends is tripping. They don't listen. You're in a room full of people who will listen. That's why you're all here. So if you don't take this opportunity to share, then I will have to be a man, I will have to be an old meathead guy and be like, don't go home and complain. Yo, first off, you guys are dope. Ted, Tyler, everyone, thank you for doing this. Um, this isn't easy, but luckily I did a vulnerability challenge a few weeks ago, so I'm prepared for this. <laughs> Still not easy. Um, so to give you guys some context, I moved here four months ago um, for a job, and I came out here not knowing anyone. And I usually have been just so great at like, I didn't know anyone, I was just like, let's freaking go. Like, I love the opportunity, the challenge, let's do it. That's my attitude. Um, and I was gonna ask this in the Q&A, but you guys can speak to it here. Um, this is like the first time ever, like, I used to tell people, not tell people, I told them in my head, like, when they were depressed, or they, essentially I would tell them, suck it up. Like, I would listen, but I would tell in my head, like, yo, whether it's a girl or whatever it is, I'm just like, come on, like, can't you see life is so great? Like, let's go, you know? And that was, you know, I'm young, I'm only 28, and so came here, and of course, what happened? I met a girl, and uh, this is the first time ever that it was just like, boom, just like took, like, my breath away, to be honest, and uh, went too fast, too quick, and essentially, it's funny that I was telling myself earlier today, even before I came here, I was like, Ben, freaking just let it go, dude. I'm like, let's go, come on. You know, I'm like chilling in the pool, and I went on a hike, and I'm like, damn, life is good, but I like, in my head, I can't get this out. And I'm sure we've all felt that. So that's what I kind of let go. And Charles, I know you told me last week to basically power through, but <laughs> just to call you out. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> Any, anybody want to take this before I yell at Ben and tell him to power through? Well, I, I could relate, Ben, because you know, I've been there where um, I was in a relationship and I thought it was everything. And I had to walk away from that relationship to build myself. And I'm sure, room full of guys, we've all had, had at least one female break our heart, right? And <laughs> I'll, I'll judge by the laughing and the, and the teeth sucking that, that we all could relate. But I think the focus was, it wasn't so much, you know, life's so great, let's go. I think I got focused on building myself. I kind of put my head down and just started meeting people, started putting myself in new scenarios, new situations. And, and to be honest, it was on purpose to try and forget this girl. I was running 100% in the opposite direction into what was next. And I didn't know what it was. And I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't all healthy. It all, wasn't all great. There were some questionable decisions that were made, but after I kind of stopped and looked around, I found myself um, being okay with, with that relationship being passed. And there, there comes like a middle ground where I went from, I used to be not like being alone, 
I used to be not fully confident to the point where I was single for a long time after that because I went from can't, rem can't remember this girl, can't, can't stop thinking about her to I don't need a woman to I'm, I'm it, I'm the man, you know, I'm the prize. And I'm not gonna lie, that's been my mentality ever since and I think it still is, is men, you are the prize. When you work on yourself so much and you build yourself, you're the prize and wait until someone, some female or male, depending on what your sexual orientation is, wait until someone sees that and they appreciate that and that's what you save yourself for. We all give them feedback on sure. this. Sure, anybody that wants? Man, the only thing I, I can say to this, because yeah, we've all, we've all dealt with it. I've dealt with a failed marriage that was as bad as situation as it could be. Um, I love, the difficult thing is that it's usually in hindsight that you realize what you were learning through, through the process. And that's why I love so much of the stuff I'm doing on social media is because I, I want to find people that are going through it now and make sure that they know that. That, hey, you know, there's, there's some exact purpose and reason the way you have to go through this because of this, 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 and this. And it may be a month from now. It may be 15 years from now. But as cliche as everything happens for a reason, everything happens for a reason. And I think it does take time, intentional time, to sit back and figure out, like, huh, what, what, did, what did I learn from this situation? What could I have done better? I think it's very easy in those scenarios to start pointing the fingers at other people. Like, she did this, she did that, they did this, they did that. But taking full ownership of the situation, say, what could I have done to make that situation better? And now what can I do to move forward and learn something from this? Because the only way... You can see that relationship as a failure or, or as a loss as if you didn't learn anything from it, that you don't go into the next relationship. And I know for a fact I am the husband I am today because of my failed marriage. I'm the father I am today because of my failed marriage, without a doubt. And that is a just beautiful thing for my wife now. <laughs> just kidding. But really, like, I... It's in hindsight that we learn that. But there's something that you're supposed to learn through that process, and there's something that you're supposed to get out of it, and, uh, and it'll all make sense one day, 100%. So, and, and I'll get off the mic here quick. If, there, if you forget everything I say, just remember this, guys. Like, name and need. Name and need. Name what you're feeling. I mean, if you are feeling depressed, name it. If you are feeling anxious, name it. If you're feeling thrilled and happy, name it, and then follow it up with, and this is what I need. This is what I need. I need someone to celebrate with. I need someone to pat me on the back and tell me I did good at work today. Or I need someone to share space and talk with me. Like name and need. And if you part, make this part of your regular rhythm with a community of men or even your spouse, I'm telling you this is, that, that would be really transformational. So thank you so much. Thank you. Sharing. Can I challenge, what if you don't know what you need? Sit right there. And I don't know what I need. And that's why I'm here. Well, well Ben just snuck one in on me a little bit. Uh, and I'll say this. Now, funny me would just be like, I'm going to tell you guys the first thing, Ben's a d So, and then we go from there. Uh, but no, so we had, we had a conversation the other night at the GVL Hustle, uh, the event that most of us attend all the time. And Ben said he was, and this is why I, I kind of, and sometimes it is okay to put a foot in, we're live, to put a foot in, sometimes that's necessary. But Ben was like he was lonely. He used the word lonely. But on Easter... I said, I just texted Ben for no reason. I texted Ben, I'm like, what are you doing? Nothing. Yeah, you are. You're coming out and you're eating with my family, my girlfriend's family at the horse farm. We're going to have a picnic. Come on. I text Ben all the time and I say, what are you doing? I, Man, come hang out with us. I know he's new here. I know what people need. That, that's, a, that's an overall need, other people uh, being social. That's a need. So when he told me he was lonely, I was kind of like, what you mean, you lonely? But that's not it. But he just named it. He named it. It's depression, and that's a whole different animal. It's not being lonely. No, if I'm like, you're lonely, I'm like, dude, there's no reason for you to be lonely ever. Stop that. Man up. Power through it. You have people who want to hang out with you. If you're lonely, you're choosing to be lonely because you're staying away from people. So naming it is the key. I kind of want to ask you guys this, and I want to throw that out there because it's part of creating space for men that most statistics show that men suffer from loneliness more so than the females. And the, the crazy thing about loneliness is you could be a room full of people and still feel lonely. 
So is loneliness the physical spot that you're in or is it a mindset? It's a mindset and connection. Yeah, I would totally say it's the mindset. It's kind of like the kid that says, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. You know, or they go, you know, a kid will go in the closet and play. You know, and, you know, most accidents happen in a curve. It's in a turn. It's where the biggest wrecks happen. And that's what happens to men. We're kicking down the road, everything's happening, and we hit this curve, and that's where we lose control. And I'm going to tell you one of the, you know, to me, it's the equivalent of trying to text and drive and hit a curve at a certain speed. It's your secrets. And that's why you go in the closet. That's why you take your ball and you go home. That's why we have a hard time connecting. We have way too many secrets. And I'm just being real. And, that's a, and it's a lack of transparency, but it's because of a secret. We won't bring it into the light or we bring in a part of it into the light. And that's what makes us not be what I like to think of as a dangerous man, a man who can live at a different level because a man that's that dangerous is willing to sit with somebody and say, I'm going to tell you because guess what? My belief is if God knows, I don't care if you know. I'm just being honest with you. We've got to get to that point because you can't heal what you don't reveal. And a lot of what we feel is we're not, we live in secret. Now, I'm not mean coming up telling everybody everything about your business. Well, I'd be scared of you if you come up and just started telling me everything was wrong with you. I'd be like, let me give you a therapist number real quick <laughs> or a counselor or something. But I'm just talking about when, you, when you're around people and what you're doing is you're giving a version of yourself. You know what I mean? Back in the day when they did the Shakespearean stuff, they wore the little mask, they put the mask up, but you still knew who the person was. Isn't that crazy? You know, they, it's like, you know, if, if Charles was back doing some Hamlet back in the day and invited me, and he's like, Sir Charles, you know, and I see him up there with that little mask on, I'd be like, look at Charles up there. But then he started talking and playing the part. Eventually, you lose sight of Charles because you see the role that he's playing. It's like if you were best friends with Harrison Ford and you knew him when he's flying an airplane, but you see him on the set of, or watch him in a movie, and you go, wow, I lost sight of my man Harrison Ford. See, that's our thing. We're losing sight of ourselves, and we run around with, and that's what it, it's a hypocrite. A mask in the Greek is called a hypocrite. It is the hypocrisy that we put up that we show everyone else because of a secret. It's not just insecurity. Most of our insecurities come from the fact that I've got a secret. Man, you just, you just crushed that. <laughs> Man, I, and it's exactly what I was just thinking in that we could all come together, all of us, every single person, every Sunday night, we could all come together like this, every Sunday night. And we could feel like we know everybody. And if you don't know the real me and my secrets and what I'm really going through, I can feel absolutely alone. Because I'm sitting here thinking, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I did yesterday. You don't know what I did last night. You don't know what, what I'm battling from this past month or what I'm going through right this very second. And it gives you the ability to be surrounded by people but feel the loneliest you've ever been. And so until we start making, putting intentional effort into creating that space for others, because for you, like, you needed space to be able to talk about it. Somebody needs to create that. And so, you know, a lot of us raise their hands and a lot of you are lying, saying that you have these conversations with people a lot, that you have somebody that you can talk to. But even if you do, that's great. Now it's your responsibility to create that space for somebody else because the majority don't. And so there's the times in your life where you're going to be in a great place. And it's during those times where other people are going to need you. And conversely, there's going to be times in your life where you're not doing great, where things are happening because you're either headed towards coming out or you're in the middle of a storm where you're going to need somebody else to create that same space for you. And so for those of you that are in a great place right now and you're like, man, I got these, this group of friends we meet for breakfast. I could tell them anything. They could tell you all my, all my struggles right now. That's awesome. Now go be that for somebody else and somebody else and somebody else because that's the only way we start this movement of people that are actually walking around living in their, in their true self and not putting on these masks and just parading around like everything's okay, but deep inside they're you know, suicidal and they're facing depression and they have no idea how they're gonna make it to the end of the day. We have to create that space for them to be able to, 
to be able to talk about it. Well, speaking of that, with, so the, the folks that rose their hand saying they have a space, we all know game two of the NBA Finals. That's tonight at 8 o'clock. Don't worry, guys. We're going to get you out of here in time to catch the game. But, who, by the way, who are we quoting for? Golden State? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> no. <laughs> Raptors? Yeah. All right. Drake? We're pulling for Drake. <laughs> but so let's say tonight after this, you, you go, you watch the game at a buddy's house. You have a couple beers. He's like, oh, how's things going? Oh, you know, it's good. It's, it's straight. And all right, cool. You watch the game and you go home. Does that count? Does that count as space? No? Are you? Get him, Danny. Ladies and gentlemen, give Danny a round of applause. How are you guys? Uh, my name is Danny Morales. I'm the founder of Coco Bowls and CEO. I kind of wanted to touch uh, base with what you said about the dirt, right? Like, I'm listening to everything that you guys are saying, and I agree with everything. But the thing that is on my mind is like, what happens like when you're growing up, right? So I'm 34 years old and I have two daughters, um, one on the way. But I always have a problem with, uh, well, I had a problem with like the way I grew up with my dad. Like my dad is a great man, um, but he had that tough love. He's, uh, you know, he was uh, in the military in Ecuador. So he always had that tough love of how do you, you know, you fall, you gotta get, you gotta get up, you can't cry. Um, so as I got older, I always had a problem with emotions, you know. Uh, even when I go back home, like when I hug my dad, it just feels weird. Um, and I carry that even to my relationships with my wife and et cetera. So what changed for me was when you say like going back to who do you talk to? What changed for me was I learned to talk to myself first and kind of digest, peel back everything that I was going through, realizing that what I was going through was because of my upbringing. So um, my wife to this day, she tells me like, because you know, me, my, my relationship, my, my whole family is kind of awkward, and I tell her, her that it doesn't bother me. Um, and it, not that it doesn't bother me, but I've learned to understand the why. So when I'm able to understand like, that's just the way my dad is, you know, like that's just, he has his demons to deal with and the way he grew up. Um, and you know, I've always tried to like say, make him change or understand it, but I've just realized like that's the process of life. Like that's just the card that I was dealt with. So um, I feel like what you're saying, I just, I can't have a conversation with someone else or give them advice if you're holding on to what you're pretty much dealing with. So like my main thing was like just figuring out the why and then even like the process, when I started changing that mentality and realizing like this is just the way life is, there's some things that just happen and there, and the, the things that have happened is because of the way that my dad grew up. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, even with like Coco Bowls, the food truck, right? Like we ran the food truck and like my mindset just changes that. Um, they closed the bridge on us and I never got depressed because I'm like, that's just life. So I don't know if you could touch that. It's just, it, you know. Yeah, man. Um, hey, congratulations. How old are your daughters? Uh, I have a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and another one on the way, October. Nice. Hey, you lifting them weights, yeah. bro. Yeah. <laughs> three. You're yeah, going to be needing to deal yeah, with them. Yeah, no, yeah, I know. Three girls, three girls. Yeah, well, you know, if you need somebody for that scene from Bad Boys when they come for that first date. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we're all available. So, um, uh, but, so I'm in your boat, but a different side of it. So I have twin 16-year-old boys. And all my, a lot of my friends here met them. They're 100% they're adrenaline, testosterone. That's what they are, and that's who they're going to be. Uh, my grand I lived with my grandfather, very stoic character. I mean, I, mean, I know he loved me because he actually said, I love you, but it would be yeah. that. We didn't hug. We didn't, we didn't ki kiss on the cheek, none of that stuff. If you even think about the relationship between a boy and a girl, at a certain point, you stop kissing your little boy on his head or on his cheek, but you always continue kissing your daughter. It's just the dynamic of people that we've, we've established. To say if it's right or wrong, it is what it is. But uh, uh, one thing that a lot of us talk about, and if you've ever talked to me a lot, uh, I know Tyler preached about it a lot, is legacy, right? And legacy is implanting in your children you know, what, what you want them to carry on. And it ain't all money. 
So I posted on Instagram the other day about my grandfather. Um, I talk about him a lot. I talk about the things that he taught me a lot. And it's all about improving. Um, one thing I used to like when I teach people to talk, it's like the story of five and 20. We go in a casino, I have five dollars, you have 20. You come out with 40. I come out with 30. Who did better? Me. Because I took that five and I multiplied it six times. You just doubled your money. So that's, that's the thought process. What did your father give you? Because he gave you a lot. I hear it in your conversation. Even though he was stoic, even though he was angry, but he gave you a lot. So you're changing that though. You're taking that to another level and implanting that in your daughters. If you ever have a son, you're gonna implant that in your son. So your son and you won't have that relationship. Your father's not gonna change. You can talk to him all you want and you should still try to give him that, hey dad, I love you. I love you flat out. You're my dad, I wanna give you a hug and I want that for you. But he doesn't have to change because you're happy about what he gave you and he literally gave you at some point something that's allowing you to see past that. It's allowing you to see, man, Dad gave me a lot, but this isn't right, this isn't right, this isn't right. And nobody's perfect. So take that that he gave you, and now take that to the next level and give it to your daughters. If you, if you decide to mentor someone, give it to a young man. Like, hey, buddy, here's, here's what I can offer you. It's that leg that's where the idea of legacy even comes from. It's that you've got it. I mean, you, started a bit, you, you showed up and started a business. No, no, and I definitely agree with you, and I don't mean to sound like my whole thing was like, and maybe I came wrong across the wrong way. And I agree, and, I, and, and it's right. Like, I took everything from my dad, you know, great. But I'm just trying to say the reason I was able to, to go to that next level was understanding that that's just the way it is and take all the good. Because I feel like sometimes we might be, like, when you say, why can't you talk to the next guy or why can't you talk to your friend, right? Because you have not opened up to the, maybe the feelings that you've had inside, like you're dealing with your own issues, um, so you, you can't ask questions, or you can't like open up, because you're still dealing with your, your stuff. Um, so kind of like what he said, yeah, so that was, I was just saying that like, um, that's kind of what happened to me, like when I started kind of dissecting with the relationship with my dad, and it, not in a, in a bad way, but just in the relationship with what it was, whether it's bad or good, if you just understand it, you know, just what you were given and you say, you know what, like you said, this is the great things that, that are part of the relationship, these are the negative aspects, and these are the things that I um, would change because that's what I felt. It's like all, the way I grew up is what I was carrying to my next chapter in life. So I had to, which was good, but it was also a lot of bad. So I had to kind of pause and talk to myself, um, talk to my wife, which my partner, and kind of see everything from the outside of my growing up, if it makes sense, and then I was able to move forward. Because if I wasn't able to do that um, and look at every, the, the bigger picture, like you kind of said, like all the great things that, that my childhood brought, I would have never been able to be where I am today. Would you say, because everyone needs to know, when did it click, right? When did, you know, we all wonder, when did it happen? Like when did you all of a sudden flip the switch? Would you say it's when you got a vision for more of what you wanted and who you wanted to be, right? Is that when it clicked for you? Or was it, was there something that, what ha something happened? A big blow up, a big family issue that said I need to break away. Which one was it? Vision for what you wanted or something that said I had to break away from that type of behavior? Probably like I had to break away from that behavior. Okay. It's just like. I mean, my background is an ER nurse. I've been an ER nurse for 10 years, still an active nurse before Cokeables. And it's funny because that kind of helped me. It's like an alcoholic um, parent, right? A lot of the times the kid is, becomes an alcoholic or a drug addict parent. A lot of the times the kid also becomes that. And I started thinking like, why is that? Like, because, so kind of like the same thing with me. Like my dad's a very strong, uh, kind of aggressive, yelling, uh, character, greatest heart in the world, but like just his, the way he speaks is just very rough. So when I became an, uh, an adult and I started be, having relationships, I did that. It's the same thing kind of with like alcohol. So it took me maybe an argument with my wife to see like, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to be this because I saw my dad do this with my, my mom, let's say, right? Um, and it took that understanding that, all right, I don't want to do this, 
but the reason I do it is because that's my norm from seeing it as a child. Then I was able to step back and say, it is your norm and you learned it, but it doesn't make it right, so let's change it. And I feel like a lot of people, it's like my daughter, my daughter's two, I could feed her whatever I want, like I, mentally. I could make her you know, love this, hate that, and that will be her norm because that's what she knows, her brain's empty. So as she gets older, she's gonna have to live with that. And that's what happened with me. I, I, would, I don't wanna yell, but I do it because that's my norm from everything that I was fed through as a, as a child. So it took me understanding that just because you do it or because you, it was your norm, it's not really your norm. And that's when everything clicked and I just started changing. And that just trans, transferred to careers, uh, just taking chances and then just going through life because it's just like, like tomorrow, if something, ha if I get, if something happens with Coco Bowl, it's like, I accept it. I'm just like, that's just life. Like, what's the next right. thing? And it's just. So, so I, love the, I love the power of it because it, it was, a, it was a, an incident. You started to notice from an argument. But the vision kicked in. So the first was you paid attention to what was going on. You figured out what was going on. And you said, now this is what I want to do. So I did get away. But the vision is the part. So here's a simple one, two, three I like to tell people. You learn something, unlearn, so you can relearn. Period. Exactly. That's exactly what you yeah. did. Danny, thank you. thank you. Thank you, guys. So were you watching the game tonight or not? Nah? <laughs> so, okay, so can I comment on your question? Yeah. Like, does it count? Like, does watching the game just hanging out and then going home, does it count? Yeah, does it? I'll say this. It can count. Like, it can. Like, you can watch a game, laugh, joke around while the whole game's going on, and then mute those dumb commercials and talk. Like, you can do that. Like, and you, so you can watch the game, hit mute. Like, people do not like watching a game with me. It's strange because we're just coming out like, mute. And they're like, oh, Parker's going to ask a hard question. <laughs> yeah, I am. Because we're going to spend three hours <laughs> in the same room. Okay, we're going to talk about something, right? We'll have snacks and all that. But, like, but, and, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm not telling you you will stop paying attention to the game. But you dive, like... You just start talking to your buddies during commercials, all of a sudden the game becomes less important when your buddies open it up. So yeah, it can count, and you can use a game to get together. That's a great excuse. And if nothing's, but just think, three hours, you know how much, you know how much commercials they're just shoving out? Don't, don't let them make money off you. Just hit mute and talk about stuff. So it can count, but that's personal responsibility. So it can count, but it's personal responsibility. I'm not watching the game at your house. <laughs> yeah, I got snack. I'll get that flavored water, they that Topo Chico. <laughs> well, so I want to unpack with whether it's watching the game, creating space, when you start communicating with other men. I think as men, confidence is important to all of us, right? You know, you think of the gorilla, the, the silver back, the, the, not the king of the jungle, but shoot, the king of the jungle, right? We all want to be that guy. What does creating space do for one's confidence? Because I think just my view on, on being the modern man and being a man in today's society is it, it's coupled with confidence. We have to have confidence in our business, in our relationship, and, and confidence in our interactions with others, but more importantly, confidence with who we are. So I'd really like to kind of unpack how communicating with other men and, and creating that space, what that can do for one's confidence. I think it's important in that process of Let's say you're in a conversation with someone, and I think you alluded, at some point you alluded to this idea of, of creating space for someone else, but feeling like, I don't know, I, don't, I haven't figured out my stuff, so how am I gonna figure out your stuff? And I think it's super, super important for us to understand that we don't have to have the answers. That I don't have to become perfect to then be able to now go and create space for somebody else. You don't even have to have a solution. It's literally just, sitting in this space of non-judgment and in understanding that you can validate someone without agreeing with them. So you could sit and you could tell me something that I do not agree with, whether it's ethically, morally, whatever, but I can validate that that's what you're going through. I can validate that that is a real thing that you're going through. And then just to be able to say, I understand. Maybe I can talk about something that I've been through, but I'm not 
taking your situation and saying, well, here's what I would do. All right, let's get out some paper and some pen. All right, let's figure this thing out. Let's draw a little chart here and, you know, one, two, three, and, you know, all that. Like, it's literally just being able to talk about it and then just sit there and just say, man, you've been carrying that around for a long time, haven't you? Yeah. And just be in that space with them. And, and just you not being judgmental, not you trying to fix them, not you pretending as though you're somehow better and that this is something that it's, it's understanding that I'm not alone, that I'm not crazy. I think a lot of us are walking around with stuff that has happened to us, stuff that we've experienced, stuff that we've done, and we think we're the only ones that have ever been through it. We think we're the only ones that ever, you know, did that thing or had that thing done to us, and we feel isolated like we're on an island, and that's what creates that separation. And, and the, the wider that separation, that's where that depression sets in, and we feel like no one could possibly understand what I'm going through. And the reality is the person that's creating space for you, they may not be able to understand what you're going through but they can validate that you're going through it and they can sit in that space with you. And I think that's so important because if we all sit here and we say, okay, great, all right, we've got to create space, got to have these conversations, I got a lot of work to do on me first, then we'll never get there. The conversations will never be created, the space will never exist. So it's understanding that we're all messed up. Every single person in here could stand up and say, here's what I'm going through, here's what I went through. And it would get worse and worse and worse and worse and oh my God and holy crap and I've never even heard of that but that sounds terrible, like, because we yeah, like we've all got it, we've all got it and it's just understanding that no matter what it is you're going through this I'm going through that, it's different but it's equal. It's just stuff that we're going through and it's being able to sit in that space with someone and say man you got stuff I got stuff let's just talk about it. Because what's the alternative? It's bottling it up and letting that stuff just sit there and fester and fester and fester. I also want to apologize to you because my ketogenic diet has not allowed me to participate in cocoa bowls for so long. And it has been the biggest temptation of my entire life. I just want to say that. The bowls are good. Like, really good. <laughs> so, um, and this is, this should tuck right in here with, what, what Tyler just shared, because that is so true. Um, and that's empathy, basically, what he's talking about. Um, but confidence also, if you look up the original word, it's, it means with faith. Confidence, if you look it up, do a study, it means with faith. And a lot of the times we, don't, we lack confidence. It's not just an insecurity, it's, it's a lack of faith. And to me, you don't have, faith isn't something to man, use to manipulate to make something go your way. It's, it's something that gives you the confidence that whether it works or not, I can own my outcome and I can do it confidently. I can show up and be a part of it. And I think creating the space that Tyler just shared about that empathy will help a pay person to get that confidence with faith to have a conversation. Faith is the, who knows what it says, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer, I read the word, who knows what it means? Substance of things, hope for. Evidence of things not, you haven't seen. That's called confidence. That's what people need. I don't see my way out of this. Good. Let's have faith. Confidence. I don't know what to do. I don't have an answer for you. I'm just going to sit with you. Keep talking. I understand. I mean, I kind of do, and I don't. But I'm here. I just think we need to add that element to understand when we feel the lack of confidence, it's really we lack some faith. So get in that area of your faith, what it is that you really believe about that, and get a hold of that so you can build that confidence. And hopefully you'll have an empathetic friend that's going to be with you in the process. Don't do it alone. You're your worst, trust me, you're your, own, your worst counselor. Don't ever try to just counsel yourself. Yeah, and this isn't like uh, a real new idea. Um, it's just something we're bad at. Um, and, we're, and we need to work on it. It's, it's the creation of everybody's not like you. So if I listen to your situation, from my standpoint, I'm, I may be an expert in this thing. You're having a problem with a relationship. Well, I'm a relationship expert. That's stupid. Why are you having a problem? It's trouble. It's, I, I got this. And, and, and I come at you like that. But I'm not a product of your experience. I'm not a product of your life. I don't, under, I don't know what you've been through at the start of that conversation. And there's so many things that have happened to you over the course of 
be it, it doesn't matter if you're even, if you're 20 years old, 20 years is a long time. You've had a lot of experiences, a lot of thoughts. So when I'm talking to you and I'm explaining to you and I'm listening to you and I'm hearing you, I have to remember from, from my side that he's not me. He doesn't, he didn't go through, he hasn't been through what I've been through. I haven't been through what he's been through. I haven't seen what he's seen. I haven't lived that life. Um, his parents weren't my parents. I don't have the same feeling. So when we talk about creating that space, I, I still hold to the fact that we need to create the space for somebody else first. Start making it okay. When people talk to you, they need to feel like when they walk away, like, man, I feel like I can tell that dude anything. And he would at least listen to me. He would at least hear me out. He would at least want to try to understand where I was coming from. And that's, that's where we can start to understand one another. Because my, and this is, this isn't like something I've been doing forever. I'm not like some relationship guru, some man-to-man high-five group educated person. This is something over the past few years that has developed within me. Like, my deepest conversations are with those who have communicated with me first. So I've let everyone know that it was okay. You can, you can talk to Charles. Charles, will, he'll listen to you. He'll listen, and he's not going to judge. That's the first thing. I'm not going to judge you. You know, if, if something, you know, but old Charles would have said, you, you said you're sensitive about this. I'm like, why? Just handle it. It's, it's not an issue. That was old, that was old Charles, but as, I, as I've grown out of that, out of being that person, and started to understand that this person has an issue with this for a myriad of reasons, and I start to understand them, then I start to feel like even in the conversation of, of us discussing where they're going through, I'll spill a little bit. You know, I'll spill, well, this happened to me back in the day, and, and it's something, that's something I hadn't shared. Went, okay, and, and it becomes a back and forth, and, you, and you're able to share with one another, and you might not, and you don't have to have answers. And we're men, the worst thing we do, how many people when, when your wife or significant other is telling you something, and she's telling you, and she's like, well, this happened, this happened. And you're like, well, baby, you should do this. And you get yelled at immediately. So like, they, they don't want no answers. They just want to talk. Weirdly, we're actually deep down the same way. I don't always need an answer. I just want to tell somebody, somebody else hears me, tells me that I recognize that happened to you and that it is okay. And you know what? If I want to answer, just like your wife, I will say, what do you think? And then we can start a conversation, a process of finding a solution. But that's that key. Just remember that that person is not you. They are not anything like you. If you look at all these bricks on the wall, there's not one that's the same brick. I guarantee you. So that brick will react different to dropping a ball on it, to getting thrown across the room. And all those reactions are different. So when you think about that, when you go into a conversation with another person, it just gives you a different spin, a different thought process, and you're willing to accept what they're saying. Well, at this time, we're kind of coming to the last half hour here. I want to make sure I invite any guy in attendance to walk over to that mic if you have a question. This is a portion where we're opening it up because we want to make sure that we, we serve the people in the room. So if you have something on your mind, something that's weighing on you, feel free to walk up to the microphone and uh, have your voice heard. And we'd like to address it and kind of air that out in the room. But uh, as we wait for that, Ryan, come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan McMorris in the building coming over to talk to you. <laughs> they did. They did. Hold it. What's up, guys? Um, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, really honored that you guys are here. Love all you guys. You guys are awesome. Um, newly married. Uh, anniversary coming up this year. Nice. Um, and I would say one of the biggest things that, that we've gone through, uh, we own a business. We own an online business. We've been doing it for the last five years. Um, and my, my wife has been going through it. Like, she's been going through it. And typically, I would have been the guy that was like, yo, like, this is your issue. You're a strong woman. Like, you, you need to go through this. And, you know, I'm here for you. Um, and I recently came across something that said, like, you need to rise up. And I read it. It was from, um, I can't remember the guy's name, Garrett. Garrett Jones, uh, the Warrior Within guy. I don't know if you guys know that guy. Um, but it, it just really spoke to me and said, you need to rise up. So it's been, it's been a battle for me for the last, like, probably two weeks of, like, how can, how, how can I rise up for my wife? Like, how can I be better? How can I show up better? How can I be better for my wife? Um, especially now looking at it as, like, it's not her issue because she's a reflection of me. And so if she's having an issue, it's, it's my issue if she's having an issue. Um, and so, but I, I'm still in this battle of, um, of really how to rise up, how to know like where to rise up, is there a specific place to rise up? Um, because I know she's, she's kind of, well, she's, well, she's pregnant. 
Okay, so that does not help anything ever <laughs> in life. <laughs> does not. Um, but I just know that she's kind of feeling a little disconnected to God. She's feeling a little disconnected uh, from her friends. Her friends are like kind of all over the all over the country. So I don't know. How, how have you guys gone through that? I know, obviously, you know, everybody's in a committed relationship. I'm going to let the married guys handle this one. Jonathan is one of the best husbands I've ever met. What do you think? What do you think, Jonathan? <laughs> um, well, thank you. He really is. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I, so, like, babies do at any point, right? Hmm? Like, babies do at any yeah, point, right? Yeah, literally. Okay. So, I don't know. <laughs> I'll pull those I don't, I could be. Here, Here's the thing. I, I, I actually say this. I say this to uh, couples before they get married. I, I always... I always look at a couple like, we're getting married. I'm like, great, can I give you some unsolicited advice? And they're always like, yeah, of course. And I always look at the, 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 the dude and I say, here's the deal. She's planning the wedding. You plan the next six months after it. You better know what your date nights are. You better be looking at concert schedules. You better be saving money for it. So like, you're getting ready to have a baby, but now what I would, you know where you need to rise up? You need to be able to know what it's gonna be like to be her husband over the next three to six months. And then the first opportunity you get to go out on a date, questions like, hey, I w and you just use those words. I read this book. I feel like this is something I need to do. Where can I show up? Where can I rise up for you, you know, in the home? Where can I rise up for you in the business? How can I raise, rise up for you in our intimate relationships? Like, like, let her talk and, like, bring a notepad, write it down. Right. And... And allow that to be something where, like, you go back to and you are inten as intentional about that as you are reps on an exercise machine or, like, closing deals. Yeah. So, like, ask her where that can be. But here's the other piece. Like, and I, I think you know it. I think you know those areas where you can just step up right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't wait for her to communicate on something you already know you should do. And, and a lot of guys want to do that, right? We know what the right thing is to do in a situation, and we just wait for a buddy to ask us to. Or, like, some of you know you shouldn't eat this, or some of you know you should start doing this. And you're like, well, I'll do that when I get a workout partner. No, that's a bad idea. Like, go, go do it now. So if you know what you're supposed to do, go do that. And right, like right now, as she's getting pregnant, or she is pregnant, right before she's about to give birth, here's the piece. She's probably as fearful as you about the one-year anniversary because she's feeling all the stress you are. Yeah. He's not rising up. We're drifting apart. I feel disconnected. So before this baby comes, like, don't make any promises or commitments outside of, baby, I'm here for you. I love you. I'm committed to you. We're going to get through this. This is going to be crazy, but you and I together forever. Like, you emphasize that, and that's what you're doing now, and then sit down and, like, let her voice it, and then you voice yours, and, and then you'll have a game plan. I like it. Appreciate it. One of the biggest things I learned in the Army as an officer and you don't have to be an officer in the Army. Learn this. This is like leading an organization. Uh, learn to run in front. So when you're a platoon leader, you run in front of the platoon. You turn left, they turn left. You turn right, they turn right. They go with you. So as the leader of your family, if you read my description for Modern Man, you're the warrior leader of your family. So learn to run in front. So you should know what's coming. Like, that's a great thing. You, you set your date nights. You set this. You set said other things. So vulnerability, you know, everybody, I'll give you a perfect example. So my girlfriend's about to buy a horse farm. Now, I don't know if y'all know what that means, or they're expensive. Hmm. I mean, they're real expensive. She teaches, that, she teaches that Olympic stuff where they jump over stuff. You know, the only thing I know about, yeah, that stuff. So the only thing I know about it is He's I'm very good at dude. scooping horse shit at this point in my life. <laughs> I, I mean, my wrist flip is, it is mighty. So, but she's like, looking at all these places. One of these places, and we're now, as far as the facility went, we were lovely. I mean, it had a pool and a lake on the property. I was about to invite everybody over after every modern man. It was going to be great. But I, I told her, here's some things that you need to understand if we get this place. I am not going to be home. I am not. There is going to be none of that. Well, come pick me up for this networking event downtown. I'm not doing that. I'm not leaving my... I, I put it all out there up front, and she got mad up front. But as she thought about it, she was like, yeah, I don't want that place. And then she said, and I was like, okay, well, why not? Because I, 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 I'll do it. I, I haven't lived with a girl since I moved back from, from Germany. And I, I'm like, I'm in, I'll do it, let's go. And she said, well, I said, why not? And she said, because I listened to what you said and, and now once I stepped away from it and I, I walked through it, I understand like, dang, well, he's not gonna be able to come get me. He's not gonna work from home. He's probably gonna leave in the morning and I'll see him again at seven o'clock, eight o'clock, 8.30 at night. 
that, that's it. That's what it's going to be because it was too far. So what I'm, what I'm saying to you is like front run everything. And that, that's something when, when you want to be a, to be a man man, and there's still some things, and, and everybody won't agree, but there's some things that men should do, and it's not physical. It's most of it's mental. It's to stay in front of everything. It's to lead your family. It's to see what's coming, to predict as best you can, and mitigate anything that can go wrong to the best of your ability. And I, all, I know you might walk outside and a bomb drops, and that's, that, that's part of life. But there are certain things that we can control, we can do better about, we can stop some pain, we can stop some heartache. And the more you mitigate all the things that you can control, the less pain you're going to have dealing with the things that are out of your control. Yeah. Something he just said I want to touch on, which I've kind of grown into really believing is being direct and upfront. I think as men, a lot of times, especially for me and my girlfriend, she'll want some things, and I want to promise it to her, right? I want to be that dude. I want to be that guy that can get her what she needs. But I've learned that there's nothing worse than promising something and not being, being able to follow through on it. So being up front and saying, baby, no, we cannot do this. When we first started dating, she was like, oh, I want to go to Jamaica. I want to go on all these vacations. I said, no, I can't take you on a vacation. I can't do a vacation for at least the next few years. And that upset her at first. Now it's three years later, and we go into Aruba. <laughs> but she was patient. She understood off the bat, as much as I want to take her on a vacation, I couldn't. I couldn't at the time. And she put up with that and she respected the honesty. People can, they can get mad at you for telling the truth, but they can never hate you for telling the truth. Because when the dust settles, they'll be like, oh, at least they were straight up and up front. I don't know if y'all saw that moment when he said, um, you know what you need to do to step up. He goes, yeah. Like, that's the thing we do as men. Like, you know what to do. But we, we stand in front of a group of people and we ask for what's the secret? What's the way for me not to do that? Because that's difficult. That takes effort. That takes things that you don't want to do. And I think at the end of the day, that's what life is. It's doing those things that you don't want to do, but that you know you're supposed to do. And I think for me, the relationship always comes down to communication and expectations. Every breakdown, every fight, every struggle, it always goes back to lack of communication, miscommunication, and expectations that weren't met. And to me, and this comes from a place of having struggled through this and continue to struggle through this, you can't change someone's expectations. You can't argue with them and validate based on all these reasons why that shouldn't be their expectation. If it's their expectation, it's their expectation. And when you think of stuff like love, love languages, people may think it's cheesy. I, I, uh, I'm a firm believer in, in love languages and, and understanding what their language is. And when you realize it, and it's not what you wanted it to be, that sucks. But it is what it is. You're not going to change their love language. If her love language, like my wife's, one of her love languages is acts of service. I think acts of service is going to work every day and making money. But that's not the access service she is talking about. And that's frustrating. That's frustrating when I'm worked 16 hours and I come home, but somehow the way I'm going to show her I love her is by doing the dishes. And I'm like, I've been working for 16 hours. Pay someone to do that. Like, no, but me doing it. And so realizing what those, what those things are and just always communicate. You can't over communicate. It's so like, when's the last time you sat down and just talked to her about this? Like, man, it seems, it seems like we're disconnected. There's friction here, and why? And just, like, lay it all out. Um, it's not easy. But again, you know, you know the things that you can do. The rest will all be figured out in the communication. And how do, how do you do dishes? How do you do, how do, you do dishes? What'd you say? How do you do dishes? How do you do, dishes? How do, you do your dishes? Uh, working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, thanks for sharing, man. Proud of us. Anybody else want to come up to the <laughs> microphone? You're, you're more than welcome. What'd you say? I don't do dishes. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how to do dishes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, guys, thank you so much for this. This is awesome. And uh, to echo what Tyler just said, 
if you guys have not done The Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman, I cannot recommend it highly enough. In fact, I am willing to put my money where my mouth is for anybody in this room. Come see me after. If you are willing to go through Five Love Languages with your significant other, after you're done with it, I will refund you what you paid for the book. It is that significant. It completely saved my marriage. My wife and I have now been married 17 years. We went through a period where we lost a son at 11 months old. I was holding a foreclosure notice to our house three months after that, and it was completely the backbone that saved our marriage. If you have not done it, I would highly encourage you to do it. So with that being said, oh, I'm sorry, my name is Christopher White. Um, and again, please feel free to come by and see me afterwards if you're interested in that. My question for you guys who are parents, I'm coming up on an age where my son is going to middle school next year. I am having a very difficult time as a father not projecting my fear and insecurities onto my son because without a shadow of a doubt, sixth grade was the worst year of my life for a myriad of reasons, not only with the changes that we go through physically at that time, of course, guys, being incredibly short, as I still am today, I appreciate you guys bringing the mic stand down for me, <laughs> but physically was struggling with things, uh, had my parents that divorced at that time, so I'm really trying not to project my fears onto my son, and I'm having a hard time with parenting him at this point without projecting those same fears onto him, and of course, even without children, this can be the same way in your relationships. How do you have those relationships with spouse, significant others, children, without projecting your experiences that you've had. So just a question before we, we kind of jump into it. Are you, is your fear based on him experience, experiencing what you experience, or do you have a fear of things that are gonna happen to him? I would say him? that's at the root of it, is just because it was such a bad year for me experience-wise that I guess I sort of am setting myself up for the expectations that he's gonna go through similar experiences. Well, one of my sons is here, actually. He's a finished up his. Yeah, he's not. Well, he went through it, and I remember this. Our firstborn. Um, so uh, he's finishing. He just finished his freshman year of college, and I remember that because I grew up in a very rough, rough community. I mean, we would fight on the way to school, fight coming home. I mean, we weren't big, but if you were going to get into it with us, you better bring a lunch, you know. Um, so. Projection of fear, the first thing is, is you have to be careful because the thing you fear the most, you can actually bring upon you. That's something that I have, you, you, you're going to attract what you are and what you are putting off. If you look at the book of Job, it sounds like you're a person of faith, but even look at that. Job literally said, the thing I feared the most has come upon me. So one of the things I had to do was I didn't want to think about my son having to get into fights, him misbehaving. I started, I was sexually active at the age of 14, and I was doing drugs when I was 10. Okay, so that was kind of my world. And so I could start thinking, well, well, I didn't do that, so my son won't, he won't do it because I, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't show him this stuff. But still, that's, I'm, I, here's the thing, I can't take away the power of his choice. God does not violate a human being's free moral agency. So instead, what I did was I turned my attention to really speaking into who he was becoming. I do this thing, and I'm just going to share this with you because it was the best thing I ever started, and it was around the time he was in elementary going in, and I still to this day, whenever they're all together, every day I do this. I start with my, my whole family. We come together. First thing in the morning, we say, you're blessed in the name. No weapon formed against you will prosper. No disease or pestilence will come against you. You're champions and overcomers. You will live and not die. You will live spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, and financially. You will grow with wisdom and stature, and you will have favor with God and man. There are angels above you, below you, and all around you. A thousand will fall on one side, ten thousand on another, but no harm is going to come against you in the name of the Lord. Go live into your day. Every day. Can you stop by my house? <laughs> <laughs> but listen, it's not, that's not the magic. That's not the magic. Okay? Because it's them choosing to believe that about themselves. He did more to just find his way than I did. And you know what I mean? I just provided, once again, space and a covering, you know, because I missed a lot of what he did. I made a lot of stupid man moves in being distant and absent with being busy, going to work, doing all the things that I thought I should do. 
But I'm grateful at least God put enough of that in my heart to say, Tim, do not project onto him. Do not try to live vicariously through him. Let me have him, but speak something to them that they were able to carry and work on and figure out. That's all I can share. Yeah, and uh, I would challenge you, like, your, your son's going to be fine. Like, that's the first thing I'm going to tell you. He's going to be fine. And this problem that you're having, it's actually more your problem than it is his. So what you need to handle is, is that fear that you're having and, and get rid of it, dissipate it. Because like we talked about before, all your mistakes, all your troubles, you know what? Experience does a lot for you. You're now much more well-suited to help your child if he has those problems, then your father probably might have been because he didn't have those struggles. It's very hard for me to help you when I don't know. So now you know. So if that happens to your child, well, I know this, this, and this happened. I can talk to him about it. So your next step is create the space. Pull it, pull it out of him. Get him, let him. And what you're pulling out of him is that it's okay to talk to dad about whatever. It is okay for you to talk to me about whatever. I'm not going to scorn you. I'm not going to on you. Yeah, if you do something that I've told you not to do, you're in trouble. But outside of that, tell me. Yeah. Won't he be able to see the signs too? Yeah. Yeah. And you'll, you'll know, like, okay, my son, this is happening. When this was happening. So all of this, you're prepared, man. You shouldn't be. You can take a deep breath. Because when you go home, you know I'm ready. For all the things that I think might happen to my child, I know the signs, I know how to handle it, I know how to grasp it, I know how to walk him through it. That's so much better than if you had no clue and it all happened and you're like, what do I do? As far as being short goes, man, that's a blessing. (laughs) And you're creating space for him. That's the biggest thing. You're creating space and it's letting him know that that he can come to you. Like, the thing that I want with my boys, and you talked about not kissing your kids, I will kiss my boys anytime they let me. But when they let you, that's... that's yeah, that's but they, they, they don't you. turn away. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I'm not kissing them all up on the mouth or nothing, but, you know. But, I mean, it's, I, don't, I don't want that to be a distance thing, you know. But the thing is, is when you let them know that, you want it to be that they would rather come and talk to you about anything. I don't care what it is. Make sure that they know that they can. Even if you have to say it, say it, say it. They need to see it, see it, see it. But get them the things that you want to see them live out. Get them to believe in who they are and who they're becoming, that they're more than that. Get your mind on who you've become, not who you were. And then you can give that to them. You can only give them what you have. That's it. So transfer your own growth and development that you have and what you've learned. Transfer it to them. Do it through empowerment to them so that they can self-actualize for their future. Man, that's the most important thing is this whole idea of creating space isn't just things that men do for one another. Right. We're creating space for our kids and, and getting to understand more about how to create space, to create an environment where your kid truly feels as though they can come to you and talk to you about anything, that there is no judgment, even though you're their dad, that there is no judgment, that there's validation, whatever they're feeling, that you're not going to say, ah, that's nothing, or you're not going to overreact, that you're going to give them that time to where they can experience those things. I've, I listen to a lot of stuff, read a lot of stuff. Uh, I've recently I've gotten into this, uh, if you guys know Sad Guru, um, but Sad Guru is, is incredible. I watched this video the other day, he said, only in America, and he said, I, I hate this, only in America. Do you hear people say, I was raised Catholic, I was raised Baptist, I was raised you know, in a conservative home. He's like, you raise cattle. You don't raise humans. And it was this idea of, I want to cultivate my kids. Meaning, I want to allow my children to experience the things that they're going to experience one way or the other but not to have them be influenced so heavily by me. Then they go to school and they're influenced so heavily by their teachers and by the other students and by other peers and mentors that are in their life. That it's all about just cultivating a relationship with your kid that you have trust in them that at the end of the day, you're always there. You've always got their back. But having grown up myself in a very, very conservative home, I can tell you it didn't stop me from doing those things. I just didn't tell them about it. And so I would rather be in an environment where my son felt like he could tell me the things that he was doing and the things that he was going through than me not know and him still doing it. 
And I think there's probably many studies and research that could show that by being able to have that open communication that they're probably gonna have less pain and less struggles down the road from fear of having to hide it. And then those days when they do go off to college and now they have a little bit more freedom. But this idea of just cultivating that throughout their life and holding that space to where they don't feel judged, I think is so huge. Thank you guys. Chris, thank you. So at this time, we do wanna get to some, some good food from uh, Uptown Company, but there's gonna be plenty of more conversation to be had. I don't wanna just cut this off, so if one more person has a question they wanna ask, maybe something to kind of take us home, you're more than welcome to come on up. Yes, sir. Hey, first of all, I just wanna say thank, thank you guys for putting this on, because this is absolutely amazing here. Um, I'm Dr. Raymond Nichols. I'm CEO of uh, Align Life of Pelham Falls. I'm a chiropractor. chiropractor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but again, I appreciate you guys putting this on. It's absolutely amazing. So I've been battling with this question for the past couple months, I think. Um, so the thing is, I know, <laughs> you good. So I know that I have grown and I know I have evolved and expanded. Um, but the thing is, when I get around my family members or old friends, things like that, but I don't, I don't express that new me to them, it's easier to express that new me to someone that doesn't have the expectations of that. So how do you show up as that new person? That's, a, that's my question. Man, key word is show up. Show up and be you, man. So my grandmother moved me here when I was like six. Um, I live with her here, so we don't really have family here, it's just us. So whatever I become, she see me becoming. <laughs> but my family's from Indianapolis, not the nice part of Indianapolis. Literally, literally my grandfather on the other side of my family lived on Roach Street. And it, 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 it's, not a, it's not a joke. So when, when I used to go back home every now and then, I almost felt like I had to fit in. I had to, I had to dig back in and act how they acted and, and, and do the things they do. No, man. I'm going as me, gotcha. and it's up to you to like, love, accept, hug, whatever with me. Now, I'm not, I, and I'm gonna do the same to you. I'm gonna accept you for who you are, but are you gonna accept me for who I am? And if they can't do that, well, all relationships are not meant to be kept. And that's not just, and that's not just friends, that applies to family. One of the things that I do with guys I mentor, vet your family relationships. Like, literally look at them. And, you know, and there's a difference between someone telling you something for your own good, hey, you need to do this different, maybe you need to look at this, and them just not liking the way you are. Gotcha. It's 100% to show up as you. That's what you should do. Don't show up as anyone else ever. Unapologetically be you. Gotcha. Thank you. I think it's all growth, man. And, and on Instagram, after every post, I put hashtag let's grow. Because the person I am today is completely different than the person I was last year, two years prior, and anyone that knows me from high school, they don't really know me if they haven't seen me since then. And the last time I was home, I actually had a friend look at me and he said, Ted, you changed. And I looked back at him and said, of course I did. I, ch I grow every day. I'm supposed to change. And I think the fear is, and uh, I did a podcast episode with Ben talking about it. The fear is when you elevate yourself and it makes others uncomfortable, the humility in you wants to bring yourself back down. But I'm learning not to do that anymore. I'm learning to keep growing and be confident in the person I'm growing into. And your growth makes them uncomfortable because it's a reflection on them. They're like, oh, they see where you, what you're doing and what you're becoming when you were once on their level. And it's a mirror to them. And they think to themselves, well, what's wrong with me? And that's their problem. It's not yours. Your job is to, to show them who you are and try your best to lift them up. But don't apologize for growing. Don't ever do that. Thank you. One of the pieces I would add is, because I, I, so most of my family's up in Connecticut, okay. right? And I have, I don't know what your home life's like. I got great parents, some of my best friends, like great siblings. We're Irish, Italian, so there's lots of cousins, right? So just a lot of family, and, I, and I'm distant from them. So like when I want to show up, and I've grown, and I've changed, and I've, I've met new people, and I post on Instagram now, so they know a lot about my life that I forget about. And, but one of the things I've learned, though, is in my growth, it's about approach, Right, so they might not have been able to hang out with a room for guys and talk about these issues. So you can't, you have to be careful on how you approach them with your growth so it doesn't sound like 
you're the scholar who just rolled in to tell them all the things they've done wrong or not doing. Is that, are you tracking yeah, with yeah, me? Yeah, I got you. So one of the things I've done is I've used questions to like pull out of them what they're reading or what they're learning or where they're going. And then that allows me to go, well, hey, one of the books I'm learning or what I'm learning from or, hey, you know, these are the three big changes I've made in my life in 2019. You know, when you start sharing in that vulnerable side, you can show up for who you are while also like approaching them in a way that they'll respond well um, rather than you just, in essence, kind of coming in and laying out your own red carpet. That's something, because I just want to go tell everyone what I've learned, what I've grown, every book I've read, every person I've met, da-da-da-da. But I realize for them that's very overwhelming and intimidating because they might not have felt that way. So when I can change my approach, you know, it's more welcoming, more inclusive, pulls people in uh, the pull rather than the push. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And, and fellas, thank you again for, for being here this evening. Uh, we're going to kind of cut the cameras off and give everybody the opportunity to have more uh, intimate conversation while, while munching on some good food. And, and the cash bar is still open, so feel free to have a few drinks if that helps you loosen up a little bit. Before we close out, a big thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you so much to Huguenot Loft for, for hosting us this evening. Thank you to Empire Limited. Um, again, if you're looking for some clothes, Greer, Trade Street, you can find them over there. Catalyst Gym, our access uh, financial planning and investments. Thank you for, for their sponsorship. And Uptown Company, we're going to be eating their food in just a little bit. And of course, Gospel on Tap with Jonathan. Remember that summer series starting tomorrow. You definitely link up with him if you're interested. And guys, thank you. For, for coming this evening. I hope this was beneficial for you. And, uh, and thank you to Ted for having this vision and for Tyler and uh -huh. putting this together. <laughs> thank you so much. Getting here early, setting up. Thank yeah. you, Ted, for putting this on. Appreciate it. Thank you for that. And, and thank you to all you guys. I, I look up to each and every single one of you. First what? First 150 on the bar? It's on the house? Okay, there you go. First 150 on the bar is on the house. So... I'll have an ultra or two. <laughs> I don't have work till 3 a.m. We're good. <laughs> I hope this was valuable to you guys. We intend on doing this again, and please join us the next time we're doing this. We're looking at October, so go ahead and mark your calendars for that. We'll keep you posted. And if you're, I've seen some pictures taken, some video, make sure you use the hashtag Modern Man Live so we can all see that, and we'll be sure to make an online space for this, and uh, we can continue that conversation. There is a Facebook group right now. If you want to join it, it's uh, The Modern Man, and just go ahead and ask. It's a closed group, so go ahead and ask to join. I'd love to have you guys in there, and keep the conversation going and, and a spot for vulnerability. Before we close, fellas, anything else you guys want to add? Well, th with that being said, wait, Andre? Oh, four-person challenge. Charles is challenging everybody in this room to speak to four people that they've never spoken to before. So. Before you leave, even if it's like 30 seconds. Even if it's 30 seconds, like, hey, my name's such and such. This is what I do. What do you do? Can we help each other out? You live here. Are you from here? Whatever. Four people. Just talk to them. It's very easy. Now it's an open space, so it's not weird. You know? <laughs> I know a lot of you get out there, uh, it's not weird now. So what's your excuse? Yeah. Four people. You never know. You never know. You might talk to that one person who changes everything. All right. So we're going to enjoy some food from Uptown Company. With that being said, thank you for watching The Modern Man, our very first ever live recording. If you're watching this, thank you. And go out there and be a modern man. <laughs>